We are live now. Thank you, Jason. Good evening, friends, ladies and gentlemen, all the delegates who are logged in to this webinar and our esteemed faculty and executive committee members of Delhi Orthopedic Association. I extend a warm welcome to all of you to today's uh, webinar, which is a grand round on distal femur fractures. We've been doing these uh, Sunday evening webinars uh, since December, almost uh, three to four webinars in a month and uh, for two hours in the Sunday evening. We've uh, initiated this uh, to have a continuity of education amongst our members and also those who are uh, logged in. All the initiatives are based on a lot of discussions and we encourage questions coming in from uh, delegates, faculty and uh, everybody. There is a chat box uh, available with you. So you need to type down the question in the chat box and uh, they would reach us. So we encourage that you put in as many chat uh, questions in the chat box as you can, so that things are clarified uh, at the end of these two hours on digital femur fractures. I welcome a galaxy of faculty uh, we have today, and we are fortunate that uh, you can say each one is a global faculty. They've all worked uh, at uh, major trauma centers and are still uh, serving on them, and they have a huge amount of uh, trauma experience on treating, research, and teaching. All of them have been uh, large contributors towards uh, EO philosophy and also in developing uh, trauma care in their region. Today's uh, webinar is going to be moderated by Dr. Pradeep Bageja, who is a senior consultant, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, and a knee surgeon in Sir Gangaram Hospital. He is the uh, vice president of uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association and also the joint secretary of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association. So uh, uh, I hand it over to Dr. Pradeep Bageja from here to take on the webinar, introduce the esteemed faculty and uh, conduct today's session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lalit Mani, sir, uh, for giving this opportunity to speak on distal femur fracture. Uh, today, topic is very important because we are linking to distal femur fracture with our knee joint also. And our faculty is two national faculty, two from Delhi and one from international. They all are well named in the Society of Trauma. So I'll just brief about them because Dr. Manny has said few words already about them. So I just gave uh, a brief introduction of each of faculty. The, uh, I welcome Dr. Nick Kanakaris from Leeds. He's a clinical director in Leeds Major Trauma Center, University of Leeds. And he's a very highly experienced clinician and academic person and extensive uh, work on pelvis as well as estabulum and complex trauma surgery. Welcome, sir. And our second faculty is Dr. Vivek Tirkha. He's from Delhi, from Ames Trauma Center. And he's also same interest as Dr. Nick in pelvis and estabulum. And he's a very famous faculty in AOR courses basic as well advanced all over the country and i think whoever is logging they know about him welcome dr Tekha. and dr shushra sir welcome to delhi session with us because he's a famous person from nagpur and well known in promocon he's organizing every year in bombay and very closely watching each content in promocon what is said by the faculty and what the delegates want to hear from the faculty also and has a very deep interest in complex trauma surgeries. Welcome uh, Dr. Shushut and taken our request for this program. Welcome sir. And the next is Dr. Ritab. He's also a very close friend of mine and a great trauma surgeon and uh, he never said no to me for whenever I call him for any meeting or talks and he's a famous faculty for AO courses in national courses, AO advanced in trauma. And he has got an interest in long limb trauma, mainly surgeries. And welcome Dr. Ritav for the today's show. And Dr. Dean Dial, sir, uh, thank you so much for our invitation. And we're happy to hear from you. Sir is a, a 
trauma lead in the Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, and he has got extensive work in complex trauma surgeries, as pelvis and astrobolum. And I welcome all my uh, colleagues from Delhi, from executives, and hopefully after two hours will be updated at least for distal femoral fracture for tonight. And before wasting any more time, I request to start with Dr. Babulka first for his presentation. Thank you. And I request all the delegates who are listening to us, they can put their questions in the chat box. You are muted, Dr. Shashir, kindly unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. Thanks to invite me over for... Uh, can you, you see the slides? Not yet. You'll have to share again. You're audible now. Kindly re-share. Okay. Can you see? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sorry for that. Uh, thanks, Pradeep. Thanks, Lalit, for inviting me over for Delhi Orthopedic Association Grand Rounds. I'm the icebreaker today, so I'm going to uh, open the Pandora's box of uh, lower end femur with some controversies, some uh, complications uh, that can happen. So this is a 22-year-old uh, guy who, came, who had road traffic accident in uh, November 2014, patient was operated for intraarticular supracondylar right femur uh, by some other orthopedic surgeon colleagues. So that was the initial x-ray. You can see some uh, intercondylar extension and some comminution there in the metaphysodiaphysical area. Uh, which approach, which implant is the question one may ask uh, at this particular x-ray. And uh, once uh, he was operated, that's how he was operated. A very precise uh, articular reconstruction, very precise lateral plating, very precise uh, geographical and anatomical re reconstruction of even the uh, minor fragments was uh, uh, dealt by the fellow orthopedic surgeon. Uh, but are we happy? Uh, with this kind of a situation? Uh, if yes, yes, why? Because it's good anatomy has been restored, many, many screws there. If no, why not? Maybe doing all these multiple uh, screws, he screwed the uh, interim area, uh, which is in between by fixing all the tinier fragments, violating the biology in this area of comminution. And uh, that's post-operative four and a half months. Uh, we can see, of course, the articular uh, reconstruction is probably good, but the interim area, the middle area uh, is not so good looking. Uh, and that's how it's looking at the end of four and a half months. Five and a half months, patient has started weight bearing. You can see some crack developing at uh, that area in the lower end of femur. Uh, non-union and broken implant is obvious now and that's when he reported to us, came to us and that's what I did. I revised the implant, I put in the uh, a similar plate and I did uh, bone grafting in the area without much devitalizing it, going on the medial side, creating a uh, window, putting in the fibular uh, strut graft and some corticocancellous grafts. Now, is this good? Why I said controversial is I am using a different stability principle here. So we want absolute stability at articular level. We want a relative stability at metaphysical diaphysical level. So what we are talking of is an absolute concept of stability in fresh fractures. Does it also apply in established delayed unions or non-unions wherein we think that maybe absolute stability 
multiplayer fixation is the way to go but here is an attempt of me by looking at the site looking at the bone strength bone quality preservation of biology we can probably continue to have absolute stability retain at articular level relative stability at beta fissile dia fissile level another controversy is not putting three screws proximally up there so lots of controversies i created the, here the broken implants were like this indian implant that 16 months down the line it has healed i was fortunate absolute stability even in delayed union helped here but why did i take the chance because the quality of the bone was good working length biology was preserved in fact i added more biology to it in terms of adding a fibular graft intramedullarily which uh, triggered bone formation cortico cancellous grafts on the medial pocket which is there so this is a relatively recent concept works very well in fresh fractures whether it will work in non unions delayed unions if the bone quality is go good time will decide we have now done a series of uh, 14 such patients with established non unions with delayed non unions if the bone quality is good if the purchase of proximal screws is good if you give that working length absolute stability with fibular strut graft intramedullarily probably is working should i continue with my second case or okay, we just yes. take yes shushut you can continue there are still no questions so we'll take the questions combined okay so this is another uh, guy 43 year old male guy and that's the x ray x ray is of course showing that double mirror like images in the lower end of femur so we are probably thinking of hofas fracture here hofas typically is common on the lateral side when we did the ct reconstruction it is so showing conjoined bicondylar fracture if you see the posterior ct scan there so what should we do we should also consider doing ct tomograms because that will show me where it is fractured how it is fractured in the level different level of ct tomograms and that's uh, the incision i preferred because it was a conjoint single joint both the condyles fractured i preferred doing a tkr approach we are used to it as against the conventional swashbuckler or a lateral anterolateral approach so that's how i went in that's how we are looking at the entire lower end articular surface showing both the condyles fractured the duty is to restore articular surface temporarily it is also essential to understand the level of medial condylar fracture because that was the bigger chunk here some amount of comminution i held it with multiple k wires and then putting multiple screws to fix that lateral condyle medial condyle i was not happy only putting screws so i supplemented my fixation with a medial buttress plate the teaching that we had from lower end femur wherein if there the both the condyles are involved it is better to either supplement your lateral fixation with a intramedullary rod or a medial buttress plate so i use the same principle here in this conjoint bicondylar fracture fixation so a medial buttress plate was put in for fixing that medial chunk of uh, condylar fracture and that's how you see uh, the reconstructed articular surface image intensifier shows a good position of all the screws herbert screws fixing uh, the articular surface fragments on the medial side supplemented with a buttress plate on the medial side that's the immediate post op showing good reconstruction of articular surface that's uh, post op after the sutures were removed that the typical mechanism is hyperextension 
or flexion dashboard injury where in this condyle gets pushed by the tibia it's very rare bicondylar hofus fracture is rare only so many cases in the world which have been reported various approaches have been described anterior uh, medial parapatellar approach which i used vastus medialis sparing has not been used and described for a uh, bicondylar hofus fracture various other approaches have been described but this is what i thought is more user friendly we are used to it it spares your vastus medialis so post op rehabilitation is better this fracture has not been typically described in the ao or ota classification of course it's been a old story historically since 1967 we know about hofus fracture but this is b3.3 fracture uh, which we are looking at conjoined bicondylar hofus very rare and that's 18 months down the line no collapse good healing uh, in ap as well as lateral good flexion all these patients must be advocated for their restriction of flexion because irrespective of whatever you do they will get stuck between 110 to 140 and they won't go beyond the incision healed well and that's his uh, clinical result of course he walked well but he got stuck and that's what uh, the video which i took two days back and i have called him again for uh, uh getting his uh, knee released if he can get some more 20 degrees uh, of for, uh, flexion thank you very much any questions i am happy yeah. to answer thank you sir we have got two three questions on the chat box uh there is one question from dr nick himself only have you done the any infection uh, uh for the second case revision you did the first case any infection parameter you checked before yes, going yes. for second surgery yes. infection was uh, checked and he had no infection no so and we know this entity if you don't respect the working length if you try to fix all the comminuted fragments desperately you end up handling the biology too much you end up not respecting the working length so there is no compression there so if if you end up doing that some of these fractures will throw themselves into delayed union non union and only a lateral plate even if it's strongest of the implant in the world it will fail because it's you're looking at a delayed or non union so according to you how many screws do you want only two is enough if the bones are good two screws are enough and okay, osteoporotic so how many screws do i want i don't want any screws in the middle segment you bypass the entire middle segment comminution you bypass everything you create an absolute stability at the articular surface level you yeah. bypass the comminution you don't want any anatomic reduction keep all the comminuted fragments together pull them all together and then bypassing that segment you put three screws up there if you are very skeptical you can uh, do a buttress plating medially some people prefer to do it primarily i prefer to do it 7 or 8 days later once the soft tissue quiescent down i just put a reconstruction plate um, uh, medially sub um, uh, percutaneously and uh, one or two screws distally one or two screws proximally that gives adequate medial support for avoiding varus failure at the fracture site so that's good enough these days i also try putting an intramedullary rod in between a long rod and a supportive lateral pad but the whole idea is to bypass the middle comminuted segment and preserve biology muscle attachments of all those comminuted fragments you will win my one question you just said ki some people put the middle plate right away on the day one of the surgery okay. and some people do after 8 days like you are planning after 8 days how you explain to the patient after 8 days you are planning another surgery in the same fracture site i explain them on day one that you are going to need two surgeries we are going to put a lateral plate now i am going to go again and do a minor surgery after 7 or 8 days it's not american situation it's not insurance situation that you get money for that second surgery no it is just telling patient beforehand that he is going to need two surgeries all of them accept there is no problems at all 
Now, what are the choices of doing medial buttress plating? You can put a rush rod, you can put a enders nail, you can put a reconstruction nail, you can put a spinal cage, you can put a fibular stud graft. It is individual surgeon's choice what to opt for medially. Right. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Dr. Manny. Do all the distal femur locking plates have a similar outcome, outcome or some plates are to be avoided? No, no, no. It's not uh, all the um, patients. So what is the numerical uh, who land with such situation? If you are preserving the biology, it is not against lock plate. Please understand. It is about the principle of maintaining the biology in the interim segment. If you respect the biology in the interim segment, if you respect the muscular attachment of the commutator fragments, lock plates work wonderfully. But if you do not respect the biology, the lock plate, even if it's strongest in the world, will fail. And uh, if you look at the numericals of violating the biology and how many lock uh, plates will fail after you have violated uh, this biology, maybe 70-80% would fail. But uh, if you do not violate the biology, and if you maintain and respect the biology in the interim segment, 70 to 80 percent or more will succeed. Right. There's one question. Uh, what is the weight bearing protocol after fixation? Uh, for HOFAS or for the lower end femur? For, okay, for the, so for case one. Femur, case one. Uh, lower end so, femur, yeah. Yeah, so that was a case of delayed union, non-union. The fixation was good. I was happy. I started after two to three weeks, I believe, tip to weight bearing. And uh, after six to eight weeks, full weight bearing. Dr. Tilka, any comments on this weight bearing option? You are muted, sir. Unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Did you want to say something, Vivek? Shishrat. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, Didi, sir, you can continue. No, no, Vivek, finish it and then I will. Right, just, it was just a periarticular. All of them, we give toe touch weight bearing for the initial six weeks and then we put on the weight as per the check films. One question was there, sir, for Dr. Sushrut from my side as well. Uh, you put in a one plate in the HOFAS on the medial aspect. Why not on the lateral aspect also? Because you had some issues on the, if you see there was some butterfly which was not properly in the proximal fragment. So why not a plate on the lateral aspect also when you wanted to give it, wouldn't it cause a rotational or a torsional because it was a conjoint purpose? Yeah. So I could have done it. Uh, um, maybe intraoperatively, I was no not very happy with uh, violating that uh, area too much, I want it was attached with a muscular muscle fry, uh, piece there, and I took the um, uh, gast VMO sparing approach. So it was uh, right there. I didn't want to detach and uh, put a screw there. I realized it was there, uh, and I by design neglected it. Thank you. But I take your point, Vivek, because that's a potential area where it could have collapsed. You know, posterior medially. Yes. Or Dindia was saying something, sir. Any comment? No, weight bearing is the same as what Vivek Trika has explained. But I had one question to Sushrut in the first case. See, like I felt that it is already a uniting fracture. So that's why you got away with only two screws and two screws above and below, and thinking it is a relative stability with added fibular strut grafting from the medial side. Does, suppose if it is the same thing. Does, does your principle vary if it is a diaphysis or diaphysis and metaphysial junction more towards the joint? Does it vary would, or the same? I would, I would never ever again do only two screws. That's number one. Number two is um, when we removed the implant, there was very gross abnormal mobility. So though it was sticky, yes, I take your point, Didi. Uh, and I probably won because it was already sticky. He was a young guy and I have thrown in more biology. I, I probably think in addition to lateral plate, uh, the intramedullary strut graph, which was pretty long, 
did also the trick of medial buttressing you know so and of course cortico cancellous grafts in the on the medial side uh to answer your question uh, does my principle differ if it's uh, diaphyseal uh, fracture or um, uh, uh, metaphyseal diaphyseal uh, construct so here uh, in the articular area if you have noticed i have used the uh, uh, the principle that you be used to follow of the strut screw the oblique screw Uh, yeah. Uh, so two screws uh, parallel to the articular surface, one strut screw, three screw. Terrific! They uh, throw in more biomechanical strength. I would put three screws up there. Uh, if it's a uh, established non-union in diaphysis, I would probably shy away only three screws and three screws. I would add probably one more plate if it's an established non-union. So one lateral plate and one. um maybe anterior plate smaller plate but i would throw in one more plate and i would not rely only on uh, one plate to be honest establish non unions in diaphysis any comment from dr nick please yes just thank you very much basically i will go to the defense of uh, dr sushrut about the two screws they behave uh, much better if they are as they were spread apart so having even two optimally you need three but even two in this type of scenario that you have increased the stability by the intramedullary strut they work as long as they are spread apart and obviously the bone stock is uh, not he's a 22 year old person so the bone stock was very good to be honest so i think uh, you can accept this as long as they are spread and they are not clustered because they behave then much more differently Uh, as far as the weight bearing, I think most important is the range of motion to start very early in these intraarticular fractures. And here in UK, you will hear a lot about immediate weight bearing. This is the new holy grail. I don't believe it's uh, necessary for all patients. And anyhow, they do always almost more than what we advise them. So sometimes I prefer uh, telling them go toe touch. and i'm sure they will go even more as they feel confident rather than say run on it because they may actually follow my advice and then i have a more of a complex scenario to deal with so these are my answers into the two subjects i think uh, nick thanks for watching my back <laughs> thank you uh, and, and of course i totally and fully understand that in an established non union the word relative stability is a crime and that's why i put this case the whole idea of putting this case by design is that we have always always followed that non union absolute stability non union absolute stability so this is one particular case and i have 14 such cases young guys non union i have achieved success by no this is not a relative stability this is somewhere in between relative and absolute stability the risk taken because the bone was good and biology was added to it intramedullarily so i think uh, yes this is uh, why it it succeeded should we take uh, this as a message no this is not a message this is a controversy created so that we can discuss it further there are examples something here yeah. There are examples of relative stability in unions. It's all the exchange nails we do. So it's not that exchange nailing is a static or a, you know construct that cannot address non-unions. A good bridging plate follows exactly the same principle of relative stability. So I think the addition of biology with the grafting plus the strut did the the job. So not a surprise. i will throw another ball in the court even if you put two plates perpendicular plates and if you screw the biology even in non union situation that non union will persist as non union we have seen multiple operation especially for shaft humerus it goes into non union the cycle of non union continues if you don't respect the biology so biology respect is more important uh, rather than sticking to the idea of 100% absolute stability for non unions i think 
absolute stability, not everybody strips off the tissues. Only thing is, the question is like, the case by case, if you look at it, in your case, the success was purely because it's already a uniting, sort of a uniting fracture, though it was a non-union was there. But however, the fibula strut, in addition to the added stability, definitely did the trick. Okay. Maybe like, maybe like uh, whether we cannot classify it as purely as a relative or an absolute stability. But however, this is an added biology with fixation, it helped you. That's it. So I think that's why I quoted it. that article from Kodi Kojima of absolutive stability, which has been published in injury. You know, so there is something in between which is called as absolute stability as well. Okay, we'll continue ahead. Uh, I'll ask the last comment from Rita, please. Here. Unmute yes, yeah. uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Shushut's case were very enlightening. What we have seen consistently is in multifragmentary fractures, non-union or delayed union is eventually reduced to a single fracture site. So, as the fractures start uniting, the implant stresses then start rising. So, as Dr. D.D. sir said, and uh, the x-ray showed that posterior callus formation was taking place because the biology probably been disrupted anteriorly and uh, medially. But posteriorly, the biology was take, taking off and the additional stability of the fibula worked as the third screw. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Dr. Manny, sir, last comment. So, just uh, taking that uh, question of uh, range of movement, if I have to compare distal tibia, uh, proximal tibia to distal femur, I am more worried in the distal femur on weight bearing. And I want to move the distal femur early. I know they get stiff, but somehow I am more worried on putting on weight. So if I have to compare it, I will delay the distal femur a bit more than the proximal tibia. However, I will move the distal femur earlier than the proximal tibia. I take one movement. There is some noise from the background. Oh, Chetan? Chetan? Uh, so sorry, doctors. Please, huh? Dr. Manny, please continue. Yeah, I'll just, I just uh, finish my comment. Thanks, Lalit. Yeah. I agree. So we move on to the next talk. Thank you, Dr. Shushruth, for the wonderful... Uh, two cases. We'll go to Dr. Trikha, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Trikha. Please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bageja, and thank you, DOA, for again for having me out here in this wonderful galaxy of eminent speakers. I just started. It's a simple case, just to reiterate the important points in what we do for a primary C3 fracture. And to just compound it, it was like having a multiple fracture, so slightly adding to the complexity of it. He was a 22-year-old male, a polytraumatized with bilateral femur fractures, one side a segmental femur, and the second side was a distal femur fracture. Looks comminated, and he also had some rib fractures on the one side, and the chest injury was there. It was cleared initially, and we went about as soon as we were able to take the general condition and improve him initially in the first 24, as soon as he had come to us. We started by doing an interlocking of the segmental femur first. Intraoperatively, he was not so okay and stabilized properly. So we put on an external fixator because that combinated distal femur fracture would have taken us much more time. So we just put in an external fixator for it. And came out. He subsequently had a lot of acute lung injuries and was off for us for another five to 10 days. His chest improved by that time and then we were able to get him back for doing the surgery for his distal femur. In the meanwhile, we took the opportunity to utilize that time for getting the CT scans done, which were not done initially, and we were not knowing what exactly was we dealing with, especially for that C3 fracture. And that also contributed to putting in an external fixator initially. And as per our protocol of bilateral femur fractures, we do some splintage for both of them, whatever is, whatever is possible when the general condition can help us. 
and I think that putting in a nail for a segmental femur helped us for his nursing care as well. Now, concentrating on his distal femur C3 fracture, when we got the C fractures and the CT scans, both the two-dimensional as well as the three-dimensional, we could see that there was a lot of combination. It was a classical C3 fracture. You can see the amount of combination, the medial, the metaphyseal area split into multiple fragments, rotated, having a mild open fracture as well and a patella also getting severely slightly getting patella was okay not bad if you see the fractures we had a dealing with a hofas fracture on the medial side trochlear combination distally both the medial as well as the lateral condyles were smaller and having a hofas the trochlear fragment that's the biggest area of concern because that's where the patella is going to be articulating and where that's going to be causing the range of motion and overstop functional outcome. In the axial scans also, you can see the amount of combination both on the medial as well as the lateral aspect with the hopers. That brings us to the CT scan and the evaluation of that. And I feel that we were quite happy that we had just put in an external fixator for this fracture waited for his polytrauma situation, evaluated the fracture pattern and the various fractures in the, all the significant scans, and then went about fixing it because this surgery is not a one hour surgery. It is at least two to three hours and it is going to give, we need proper patient optimization before getting it done. So these were the problems which we were dealing with, medial severe combination, OFAS, metaphyseal combination and rotated fragments. Just our plan remained the simple and as Dr. Sushruth had also told, we tried to convert the C3 into C1 first, convert it into a one single entity of articular region, bypass our metaphyseal fragments and then go about fixing it to a stabilized diaphyseal region. And that was our plan. We first convert C3 to C2, then fix the hofas with the fragments, with the small fragments, screw or 4 mm screws with lag effect. If we could see the combination in the trochlear region, and that was a problematic thing for us, and we thought that putting in some HCS screws might be helpful for us out there. And a long lateral plate with minimal medial dissection just derotating the fragments which were there on the medial part with the manual palpation and reduction of that fragment will suffice to hold the medial struct for us. I still am not a big promote proponent of initially doing in a dual plating thing. And I feel that if you do a lateral plate properly, most of the time we will be getting good results. And if we feel that we go in later, we might put in another plate after six weeks or so. So this is what we had planned that the combination, we are going to put in and clear the hofas first. And then after that, we'll put in a long plate, at least nine to 11 hole. And that we went about doing it. This is the reduction which we were able to achieve without opening up the medial side. The medial combination, which you could see, we just left it like that. They took care only of the articular fragments and the medial condyle. Here, I would like to bring about a point which many a times we have regarding the medial and the plate and the diaphyseal region, which we can titrate and calibrate by putting in a compression screw. And you can decide among how much is your actual positioning of the diaphysis in relation to the articular region, whether it is going into varus or valgus by putting in this compression screw. You can see the gap in the before and then we were able to push that femur and the diaphyseal area to the place where we wanted it for maintaining a complete, a correct valgus position. And that's what we did. A lot of k wires, and that's what we always do for our fractures. And then use the locking plate parallel to the joint and long screws in the initial, in the long fragment, equidistant screws, most of them cortical, maximum three or four with a long diaphyseal span. 
So this is what we had planned initially, and that's what we tried to achieve, leaving our medial combination as well as the metaphyseal combination as it is without disturbing the periosteum hinge to a great extent. This is our incision of the same fracture. You can see that it's not a very big incision out here. And then most of the time, if you see here, this is the same fracture fragments, which you could see, and I've tried to number them also because these areas, you cannot go in and fix them, but we may try to maintain that the articular margins were as smooth as possible. Patella was normal, the medial side was not touched, and if the suprapatellar fat region, I think that's one of the regions which we should not be dissecting out too much. Let it remain like that, because that's the biology which we want to preserve, and that causes the excursion of the cordyceps also in a proper manner, which later on, if we have problems, will cause, is a major cause of stiffness. This is the fracture check films which we were able to achieve. This is his six months follow up. We can see that there is some callus which has started forming on the medial side. And that's what the initially the locking plates were designed for, though there are some indications where we can be using the medial plate very soon when the medial condyle is very small or so and we are not getting good hold. But if the metaphyseal combination is there, I still feel that most of the time the medial is the place where your periosteal formation and the callus formation is going to happen, giving it a classical absolute stability of the articular region with the relative stability at the metaphyseal region, as Dr. Sushrut had told and we all speakers had discussed, which enumerates and which helps us to get a good fracture and functional outcome. This is his 24 months follow-up, and you can see that the femur has also perfectly united on the segmental side. This fracture, which was an 11 hole plate with four equidistant screws, parallel screws on the medial side has formed abundant callus on the medial side without touching it, just expanding it to get a good view of that. And the small HCS screws can also be skinned. This is his clinical follow-up. You can see that both the sides had been brushed up. So interlock nail on the right side and this is for the left side relatively just 90 to 95 percent five percent difference in both of the fracture range of motion that we could achieve i'll end by saying that let's not forget the basics when we are doing a c3 distal femur fracture analyze the ct scans that's the most important thing don't just rush into it if you are dealing with a fracture with a medial hofas or a very distal medial hofas you may be in big trouble if you have not analyzed the CT properly. Absolute stability for the articular component, relative stability for the metaphyseal component, look for displacements, all the fragments, the combination of the articular as well as the metaphyseal region, plan your surgery beforehand, use of HCS screws, smaller lag screws, and the partial threaded screws, which you can use for the different plane. Plan it out when you're going to use them before putting in the plate or later on, but make sure that you are able to put them at a proper angle where you want them to be. And the plate, as we discussed, has to be a very long 11 hole with only three to four screws proximally, giving us a good amount of stability, not making it absolutely rigid. I think, thank you for your hearing. All this can help us in getting a C3 distal femur fracture with a good functional outcome. You want me to go to the another one or we discuss it out here? Pradeep, you are muted. Dr. Vivek, with the second case, please. Second place? Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. I'll just give you one minute. I'll stop sharing and then I'll again... So what is the consensus on number of screws in the distal part of the locking plate? Any faculty can take that. BD sir, how many screws in the distal part of locking plate? Do you fail all of them? Unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Hey, any any time you we do, it is 0.75 is the ratio, and nearly all of them we fill it up. So as much as possible. So we, as much as your fracture set allows you to do, you fill everything. So.
Can you see my slides, please? Yes, very please. Okay, so this is the second case, and this is a continuation of the first case which Dr. Sushrut had presented. He's again a case with multiple fractures. A 27-year-old male who had a distal femur intraarticular fracture on the right side with mild grade one open fracture. Patella was here, so I got slightly confused for this. He was having a combination of patella, which we see later. Proximal third of the radius on the right side, humeral shaft, and he was suspected to be having a brachial plexus injury. This was his CT scan, which we got. As I told, this is a very common thing which you need, and it's an essential thing nowadays. It was a simple C1 fracture with combination in a stellate sort of a patellar fracture with red intact retinaculum. So without going into further things, it was plan of management was simple as we had thought before and we discussed in our first case. We went about doing it the same. In fact, it was done in my operation under my team in the emergency in the night straight away. And we did this, maintained my fellows, had a very good articular, articular reduction of that and a fairly good amount of, as we discussed, one compression, holding the plate in a proper position, titrating it, and then three or four screws equidistant as possible, plate in the center, relatively a fairly good post-op image, which we were expecting with the plate slightly off-handed on the proximal side, but most of the screws are relatively okay. I'll just have five seconds for people to analyze this. March 20th, this was in November end of 2019. And in March 20th, in March 2020, he came to us at three months follow up and was advised weight bearing as we had discussed six months and thing. And it was advised because of the amount of some callus which was getting formed. And he was up given for a weight bearing with this. In April end, he comes to us with this. We felt that the plate was adequately put. It was having most of the proper sequencing was done in this fracture pattern. The plate was in a four screws, distally adequate fixation. Not much of the biology, maybe that's the thing which could have caused. And on repetitive asking, he was having a brachial plexus injury. And that was not allowing him to have his weight bearing done anything on his hands. And that also caused him, as soon as he was able to put some, after two to two months or so, two and a half months, he started putting full weight onto it. And that he thought could have been the reason for this. One of the reasons for this plate getting fractured and this going into non -union. To work worsen it, at that time he came as COVID positive. And remember, this was the first phase, March 20 and April 2020, when we were initially dealing with a strict no-no for all our elective cases, everybody in great fear of how to manage them. And in our hospitals, being at tertiary care trauma center, all these cases had to be postponed for some time. And what we did was we had to put him on a plaster. We gave him a slab and then sent him home so that he could be he could improve and then when he will come back he came back to us on june 2020 after six weeks of plaster and this was the x-ray we had hoped against hope that maybe because of the distraction as it sometimes happens in humerus it might unite and will give us a salvage which will be not having a surgery but unfortunately the fracture had my more distract displaced though there was some callus formation out here. On retrospect, if we can just discuss this, maybe we'll discuss it in the discussion time. Yeah. If, if I look at the part, we'll I discuss, feel, we'll okay. discuss, okay. Okay. we'll okay. discuss, right, right. So, interesting case, yeah. So I'll give you a sequence of events. This was his fracture. Initial x-ray looked fairly okay to me. I in the rounds didn't say anything bad to them. This was his three months old. This was the fracture in April, and this was at June. We keep this slide here only. Yeah? Okay. The things okay. are next to it also. So you will have to give some Keep time. it here. It's April 20, no? Last one is April yes. 20, 21, is it? No, oh, sir. Uh, I can. Just a minute. I'm not seeing it properly. Yeah, this is 20, June 2020. Yeah. So we have done further surgeries for him, and that's what right. we are going to discuss later. 
So we can hear some comments from Dr. Shushruth here on this slides. Yeah, so what I think is, uh, Vivek, maybe uh, on day one, the primary surgery, if we would have taken away that screw, that screw which is very near, and uh, I'm not too sure whether uh, there was cortex to cortex uh, contact was there. So let's say I, I buy that cortex to cortex contact was there on the lateral side. Uh, uh, what I would have probably done is removed that one uh, distal screw of the proximal screws to have uh, a better working length. And I might have added a rush rod. Rush rod doesn't take a long, honestly. That would have secured the medial uh, side because there is a butterfly fragment as you can see and these fractures comminuted fragments uh, minimalistic comminuted but if there is no cortex to cortex, cortex contact they take in virus which has happened earlier in virus has broken right any other comments? Vivek, I feel if I'm allowed to speak, yes. day one of post-op also, no, I'm not happy in this situation. So uh, in my practice, uh, I use even chrono sometime to fill this gap. And as right. Dr. So sometime if you feel that, and the, uh, like in your presentation, you said locking plate has developed to avoid the medial plates and you avoid that medial biology, right? So, in this case, but in some exceptions cases are there where we really need along the lateral plate some medial support also. This is my two comments here. Vivek, yeah. may I say something? Yes, sir. Hey, please, please. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes uh, this this is an excellent uh, case, and if a fellow has done this under your supervision, it's kudos to the teacher. So sometimes I probably feel that uh, during the follow up we see callus. And we are too much sold on not doing anything medially. Maybe there is a certain subset of patients where we must electively graft and stabilize medially after uh, eight or ten weeks. And probably this is the lesson, or uh, I would take from here. True, Doctor D.D. or Nick, please. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Ma like it is always like sometimes we have gone through this also and then like what you have shown in the first case also has exactly. happened it's exactly. everybody's everybody's uh, everybody has experienced this but as as the, as we have progressed i what i understood is that number one is like this should have had some metaphyseal compression suppose if we had a metaphyseal compression the circumference on which the femur is going to come and sit will be exactly be equal so what happens is in the first x-ray, if you could have seen, the medial continuity was very well established. And if you draw the vertical, it was almost alignment was perfect. Whereas here, you can see, because there is a medial opening here, so, and then it is femur is, that is femur shaft is lateralized, rather distal fragment is medialized. So your axial, uh, that alignment got changed with alignment and then the medial gap. When it is a focal medial gap, generally it fails, whereas, if there is a fragmentation, multiple fragments are sticking together. And if you get the medial cortical continuity, it all heals. That is my observation. So nowadays, what I always do is, if I had done this, metaphyseal compression would have been done. And then I would have collapsed a bit and then put the screws. So it should have been better. Yeah, right. so. yeah, Nick. yeah my comments would be, it's an excellent example. Having these two cases shown. I believe they behave differently. They behave differently because if you remember on the first, you never touch the medial envelope. Here, it's an open fracture. You're gonna wash out all the hematoma just because of the open fracture nature. You're gonna potentially remove loose pieces as you are there. So as I can see here, there is more of a defect medially. Every plate will fail, no matter. Uh, obviously having a better working length would protect her for longer. That's the advantage of the working length. So removing that screw, the non-locking screw could protect the plate. But again, if the healing was slow, again, that could fail as well. In these cases, I believe here is the possibility of considering a medial buttress plate 
to provide an artificial medial buttress that will protect your lateral plate whilst the fracture unites. So that's one possibility. The other is obviously a combination of a nail and a plate. That is, I think, another option. But I think these fractures behave differently just because of the loss of the vitality of the medial region. And we can explain that via the exposure, the open fracture, the wash out or whatever else. So they look similar, but they are not. So that's, that's a great thing. I think <clears throat> that's what I wanted to bring out because those two cases, both of them have been done in a similar fashion. And one, we are seeing a lot of medial callus. And here, as Dr. Ritab had discussed in the previous case, once the fracture starts consolidating, there is a one single fracture line which is not uh, uniting. And all the things concentrate on that region. And there can be a race. Sometimes we win, sometimes the plate fails. And that's what happens in most of the cases. And so just to continue further. Yeah. We had these options and it was discussed by Nick also. We can do a replating with a longer plate if we want, a dual plating, a fibular autograph, or a nail plate construct. These are the various options. And uh, we went about doing a nail plate construct for this. And the reasons for that for us was, I thought that if I have to go in, I had you, this plate was a fairly long plate. So most of the principles were proper, only maybe the execution of that was not so good in the initial sense. And maybe my follow-up at the time of three months, I should have seen the devascularization of the metaphysial region and should have added on to some bone grafting right there and then or a medial plate at that time. But we didn't and that's what, that's what learning is all about. Longer plate would have gone, how long I am going to go, I didn't know. Now the most of the intra-articular fragments had united. Putting in two plates, one long and one short would have, I didn't know where exactly to first finish my longer plate. So I thought that maybe a nail construct will give me a better choice where the plate can be short. And that's what we went about doing it. We fixed with the nail. We went about doing a nailing for this first and then put in a plate for that. And the callus or the things which we got from the side, that's the same thing which we put out here without any additional bone grafts out there for this. And this was the fracture at the end of the post-op with the check film. And we got this at when we did it in July 2020. And after that, this was his follow-up at two months. Yes, it's still some gap can be seen, but now we had done it fairly good construct. And I think that the only place where now it should have fractured would have, it would give some more time for the construct to fail if it had to, if the fracture has to fail. So that's what we got. And then he was lost to follow up. And I tried to find it up. You know that the last six months have been quite problematic for us, especially in India, along with COVID scenario and Delhi for particular. And this is what we could get from his mobile film, which we contacted him just on June 21st, 28 June. This is his range of motion, which he has sent from his home. You can see the big scar mark for the plate. He has got excellent range of motion, not credits to me or my team. It is purely his because he was not under our follow-up. He was at his own place doing all the things which he had to do. But the fracture, now you can see that the collapse or the consolidation of that fracture can be seen both on the posterior aspect as well as on the medial aspect in this X-ray. And that's what I hope to bring him back sometime, maybe once the things get okay and get his proper evaluation done with an X-ray properly. So in to take home message from my, this case would be that a non-union with distal femur locking is a known entity. Sometimes it is known as a distraction machine or a distractor machine, and that's what causes the non-unions to be happening. Distraction, when we are trying to reduce the fracture at the metaphysial region, not getting the adequate compression, as highlighted by all the speakers, that's the most important thing, even if we are able to get the articular reduction and the alignment in most proper manner if we feel. And for the options of salvage or broken plate, we have been discussing, there are a lot of issues, a lot of things which are available now. We can think of a dual plating, a nail plate construct, which I have shown, 
and we have discussed what is requiring is a cortical medial strut or support which may be an autogenous allogenous or a metal implant which can give us this stability which we require thank you thank you vivek for the wonderful presentation uh we'll take one or two questions and we'll move ahead vivek would you uh, ever consider doing a nail plate construct primarily um in such cases you know where there is a uh, medial void uh, clearly seen or a maybe compound injury and loss of uh, bone uh, in that fragment uh, because uh, yeah please yeah we over the years i have been a big proponent of using a single plate initially and i can say that we have done a lot of them but over the last 2 3 years with our failures which we learn from and seeing the good results of the other augmentations also i won't i still don't use it primarily as a primary surgery part but yes with my colleague dr samarth who is there we have done few cases where especially 2 to 3 weeks delay was there with open fractures with gap where we have put in a nail plate combination straight away in the first go because we knew that there is a definite void on the medial aspect which we will not be able to cover with a long a small plate or a long plate because we require a huge plate for that so for that we have used a nail plate construct right in the beginning in the primarily sometimes in open fractures we have used a plate and a combination of that initially previously i was doing it only in open fractures with a bone loss where i was using this nail plate combinations so these might be my two indications if i have to use some augmentation i still go with the dual plating if my condyles are smaller and it is a comminuted region and the metaphyseal gap is not big so that a plate will not suffice okay. so uh i think a lot of questions already answered so one quick tips from each faculty when to use medial plate one tip from each faculty on the primary day day one factory fixation is already discussed but there is a combination clear cut I'm, medial I'm, void I'm, compound injury i'm not going to answer because uh, i want to show some cases and then answer right sir <laughs> only one question it to vivek sir vivek like you see you are always some controversies do exist because see, like whenever we practice sometimes we have an intuition we go forward but in this case suppose if it is a non union would you ever not think of you said callus you would have used but bone grafting part i thought so yeah but at that time i was very happy with my stability pattern and the two months fracture when the pro plate had broken at that time when we had given him 6 to 8 weeks i could see that there was more callus from the initial x ray to this so for me the biology was not a big very big issue for me at that time i thought that there was viable bone out there which i could use if it wouldn't have been or it was same atrophic sort of a fracture pattern which i got initially maybe i would have gone in and then used the autogenous Na- nail plate is not hundred percent. We had yeah. failures even with nail plate. So I think yeah, sure. You you have to think whenever there is a non-union. Definitely, I think the tra- teaching must be that we have yeah. to give a bone graft. Yes, certain. I agree. Thank you. Any other comment? Last comment. So we go to next presentation by Dr. Nick. Can you share your screen, sir? Yes, of course. Thank you, Vivek. let me find myself so i hope you can see this yes sir please go Excellent. ahead thank you very much great honor to be with you guys i mean obviously remotely uh i'm very very honored to be invited uh, thanks to my friend sanjeev vanand we we work together many years now I work in Leeds I'm the director there of the major trauma center since its uh, creation so 9 years now uh, we are a busy trauma hospital probably one of the busiest in UK and I'll go straight to the cases uh, of distal femur we had a good discussion before in the preparation of the meeting so 
I'm going to go to the other end now, to the fragility distal femoral fractures, not to the high energy young patients. And uh, this is an example, 84 year old. It's always very bad news if you hear that they go to the rheumatology clinics because uh, you know they're going to be loaded with uh, problems. She has rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, history of recurrent falls due to her epilepsy, etc. And they are loaded also with medication that sometimes holds uh, a precious fracture healing. She has this fracture. And uh, you can appreciate is a standard uh, fracture of the distal femur, extra articular. Here, probably one question is the ideas uh, when we see these x-rays in the trauma meeting, what should we do? There are options, uh, plates, uh, nails, two plates, I don't know, combination of nails and plates even. I want just to mention that uh, if you see this, this is obviously a volar button and you turn it the other way around, they look similar. And where would we put a plate in a volar blood button? We would put it volarly. So in the inner surface over here. However, uh, the standard uh, plating of the distal femur is on the lateral surface. So probably contra to the buttress principles that we all try to follow and we understand. The other thing we can make a note uh, as far as the audience more or less experienced, you need always to get the full picture. For example, this lady, as you can see here, has a stem above and uh, she has also, also obviously a bit of arthritis. So all these are factors that may change your uh, rationale or even the length of the plate, since it has obviously a stem in the proximal femur that you may want to bridge. A scan, probably nowadays we do a scan for all of them, and we should not only just to capture HOFA elements, but also to design and plan our approach to see the amount of comminution. You can see here, it has a lot of comminution laterally and plan ahead. So I would say a CT scan is probably a key component to all these uh, fractures. So what would be the plan? She is 84, she has obviously poor healing potential, arthritis or pre-existing, moderately symptomatic, and she has a total hip above on the same hip. You want to basically one of the, if you decide to fix it, is obviously to minimize stress risers. So bypassing to the proximal stem is important. We may discuss how much of overlap you want or what is an actual overlap or not. And then uh, you want proper reduction. I think that is of key importance in this case and in all cases. The reduction, if we're not talking about the articular surface, is not anatomical reduction, but you need the length, the rotation, the varus valgus alignment, all to be restored. It's not necessarily, as we saw in the first case, to put lug screws in comminuted fragments of the metadiaphyseal region. This is ill-advised. But in these cases, you can see that the reduction is important. You want, again, to bypass the stem, as I said, and Due to the principle of mechanical, uh, providing the proper mechanical environment, I would argue that definitely the first plate you should apply would be the medial buttress. And thereafter, you can put the bridging plate laterally to minimize stress rises and to allow you know, your working length to be optimal. So I would be advocating these fractures that finish very distant laterally. We call these reverse obliques that medial buttressing and dual plating is of an indication. Now, there is a defect. You can see the comminution. Do you want to augment it and with what? Here, the augmentation was with injectable calcium phosphate. That's an option to augment a, a, metaphyseal, a metaphyseal defect, or obviously granules, autologous bone graft in this age group, I think is not a good option. The approach for medial plating 
I mostly always do separate approaches. I do a medial straight approach, and then I do a lateral approach uh, on the lateral side. <clears throat> I think that's much better, leaving a bridge to not violate the blood supply coming from the descending genicular arteries on the medial towards the vastus medialis. So I think that's also important. You can make an easily tunnel and go below it and anchor it proximally. That's the construct. She's now five months post-op, December 2020. We lost her to follow up due to COVID because she died three months later due to the, this dreadful pandemic. The key points of this first case is that always get the full picture, get a CT scan, bypass if there is a proximal stem formally. So you need to anchor with screws, not like these two X-rays here, that you just bring the plate on the stress rising point of the stem. Probably two to three times the diameter of the bone over there, you need to have an overlap and anchorage. When you have poor biology, and we have reasons to have poor biology in such a patient, expect delayed healing. So you need to maximize your mechanical support so the delayed healing will not gonna lead to a fatigue failure of your plating system plus minus augmentation. And I think for me, I skipped the question before about indications, a reverse oblique distal femoral fracture, where there is bone loss medially, or when we have a failed lateral plating is an indication for this dual technique. Uh, I'm gonna go now to the case scenario two. This is a lady, 80 year old, again, elderly. She has multiple myeloma. There are lesions mid-shaft as well as distally. They did not refer her early enough. She had a pathologic fracture. And you have now, she's also morbidly obese and diabetic. A difficult scenario that you want to address this fracture in this biology, local biology and systemic biology, high risk for infection, high risk for secondary failures. You can see it's obviously a transverse fracture, bad fracture when you want to heal such a fracture with a plate. And then the options are again to be considered. You need to be, I think, as far as you're planning, you need to choose something which is the least possible invasive it will allow this morbidly obese lady to get up and walk. Here, I think these patients, frail patients, do need to walk as early as possible. You need a long-lasting construct that this myeloma may or may not heal. It's not going to lead to a fatigue failure of the implants and not to create, of course, stress risers to her arthroplasty proximally. A nail is a good solution and then to minimize the stress riser a bridging plate inserted my hypotechnique proximally to distally, since distally did not have that much of an involvement. A proximal plate is probably a good indication, would allow her immediate full weight burning, is the least possible invasive, no stress risers, and offered her a solution. Another example of a combo is these fractures, proximal femoral fracture, nailed, long nail, well positioned, but we know by fact that patients will fall again. Eight days actually post her nail, she had a fall, they delivered this distal now femoral fracture. So here again, a combination of the plate and, uh, and an anti-grade and the anti-grade nail could be an option. And it was an option to allow again, immediate full weight burning and no evidence, no presence of the stress riser. So there is an advantage. And last case, probably most relevant to what we are discussing, a comminuted periprothetic fracture distally, where uh, in this, I usually apply the plate first to bring my alignment more in relevance. We know that retrograde nails through total knees can lead to a hyperextension deformity. So by putting the plate first, you can have a better restoration of the alignment. And then after you anchor with some screws the plate, you can offer the nail and have the combined construct that offers optimal biomechanics. is minimal invasive, there's nothing huge, if you can imagine it. 
through the old scars and offer her immediate weight bearing and uh, hopefully and eventually healing. I'm just mentioning a trial and study on the biomechanics of all these different combinations. It did show that uh, the nail plate construct is inferior as far as the biomechanics from the dual plating. However, obviously you can imagine dual plating is much more aggressive, two approaches, the vitalization potential if you are not careful of the medial genicular arteries plus the lateral, so you have a, a worse uh, biological insult, but it does offer obviously solutions to specific problems. So I will stop sharing and thank you very much. The key point is obviously as I mentioned, they do have these augmented fixations. It's not for every fracture, it's for some fractures. They have advantages when you need immediate mobilization. They are a surgical hit, which is higher. They have higher costs, and we analyzed this in a recent publication. Their cost is equal to a revision arthroplasty. You need to identify your cases and obviously plan and implement your plan. That's also important, carefully. Thank you. Questions, of course. That's the most interesting part, isn't it? Thank you so much, sir. Pleasure. Presentation is open for discussion. Any points, tips, questions? Yes, Dr. Yeah, today, your take is primary nail plate or primary dual plate? Okay. For a reverse oblique, as I call a reverse oblique, I like a medial buttress as my first plate and a lateral plate if you need a long construct because of the nature of the fracture. Yeah, reverse obliques. As I said, I call those that have a very distal exit laterally and obviously they are oblique. So these, I think I do this. For the rest, I, if I want a combined construct to mobilize the patient, specific patients early, I prefer the nail because the nail is less invasive. You don't violate the medial buttress and the medial area. And at the same time, you provide an in-axis weight sharing device, plus obviously the weight bearing uh, bridging plate laterally. And so you're I think- not thinking of primary bone grafting at all? Primary bone, no, nowadays I don't do primary bone grafting at all. I do bone grafting in open fractures like uh, Professor Trika's case that I would put maybe a spacer on that defect and come back later to the muscle kind of protocol, deliver local antibiotics because I'm afraid of infection and come you know, in a few weeks later and graft that region having just a lateral plate. And if the patient is obese or has poor biology in general because of age or whatever, I may add then a medial plate as well on that stage, on the second stage of the muscular. Dika, you were saying something? No, yeah. my, question was the, my question was the same as Dr. Social Feds asked. Thank you, Dr. Nick. I was just want to put one comment. Like we always see a five percent fracture around the uh, TKR, the proximal uh, to the femoral component. In your presentation, we can augment the plate along the nail and make the patient mobilize next day. Am I right? This is yeah, a message. Correct, because you okay. have an in axis, uh, which was the nail that allows immediate weight bearing. It was, if you remember, a transverse pathologic fracture. Yeah? Yes. So it would allow, but at the same time, you don't want a stress riser between the tip of the nail and the tip of the stem. So that's what the, the plate offers to neutralize that area so she never comes back for that leg at least into the hospital. Thank you. Yes, sir, or Dean, the answer. Uh, Nick, here. in the reverse oblique that you were telling about in a distal femur. Yeah. In, the, in your case, if there was no proximal implant, what would have been your, your, your uh, surgery? I would put a medial buttress plate. Only, only medial buttress. All, only, yes. Okay. So you know, case, you can you can bake a, a long medial plate. Does have to be short, especially if you do this uh, bridging 
that you anchor proximally away, obviously, much more proximally from the Hunter's Canal and the problem of the blood supply. See, because, you can go about, yeah. because in that case, there was some lateral combination also, because it was going all the way down and there was that, combination. And by principle, if you say that if a plate has to work, opposite cortex must be intact. So in what does that same principle work when you put the medial plate also? What do you do in a volar battle? Do you do dorsally and put another plate there? But I think that uh, the way the muscles pull and then the weight of the wrist, all those things that works, is totally different compared to what, what is in the distal femur. Yeah. Look, I mean, if the fracture is so distal as it would this case uh, laterally, the lateral plate anchorage on the distal fragment is maybe one screw. All the rest are through the fractured plane across two condyles. So I don't believe that you need an additional plate unless you have a reason to go much more proximally, as in this case. The medial buttress would actually offer the mechanical environment and healing potential on that region uh, without additional exposure laterally. They are rare fractures that, uh, you know, but if you see them on the x-rays, intuitively, you want to put a medial plate, I think. Everyone wants to put a medial plate. No, everybody has got fear of medial site, so. Correct. <laughs> We shouldn't be, it's not that scary. You have about 15 centimeters from the joint, which is totally, totally safe. You go straight from the joint level and for Hoffas, it's also buttressing medial Hoffas, etc. You go straight up to 15 centimeters uh, below vastus medialis above sartorius, nothing to be, you find the bone by closed eyes. And then with the proximal Langebeck, either you stretch that bridge of soft tissues you don't want to violate, or you go more proximally, and then you shuffle your plate below and you open proximally for your proximal anchorage. So I think is as the medial plateaus, you know, we need to get over that. It's a, a friendly area. There's a question from Dr. Manning for Dr. Nick. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Nick. Yeah, yeah, please. Excellent cases, a uh, lot of learning points. I have two questions uh, related to a nail plate uh, construct. So do you use a thinner nail or you aim at a snug nail, a snug knee fitting nail or you aim at a thinner nail? And uh, do you lock it proximally or you leave it uh, unlocked proximally? Yes, so thank you very much. Obviously, uh, the nail we use in the majority of cases it's a retrograde uh, femoral nail that has also a, a lot of options, at least four options of locking distally. Some of the screws go through the plate to the nail. If you are you know, lucky enough, not always, but you can do that. It's not, nothing like a uh, huge difficulty. Now, proximally, I lock it. Of course, I lock it uh, via basically an AP screw, yeah? Yeah. Or, so you go again, if possible, as proximally as possible. So above the isthmus, you know, around the lesser tro trocader, that would be the anchoring point of a standard long retrograde nail. But if you have a stem, obviously it limits you and you put, you know, uh, bypassing as possible the fracture as much as possible to give this internal intramedullary strut that helps uh, weight bearing basically and protects the plate. Thank you, Dr. Nick, for the uh, great presentation. We'll come back thank to you me. again uh, if questions arise. Uh, thank you so much. Go to next presentation by Dr. Dindial, sir. Yeah, I'm sharing it. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you pradeep and lalit for the invitation so it is my pleasure to be part of this delhi group so we all we always like like you guys so this is a 50 year old man i think in the initially i think you can see that this fixation has been done so lot of people will wonder whether it's a short plate why there are so many screws and also you can see that there is a distal fragment is getting medialized all these points you know that it is going to fail over a time and then that is why it has failed and then you can see it has been revised to this again if you revise it like this i am pretty sure that again it is not in the alignment has not been adequately achieved and also in this surgery again there was no bone grafting per se was given in this stage so i think again it is you expect it to go on to have a failure and that's what it has happened so in my practice what i always follow in any non union is i follow these four principles that is we have to have a contact and compression we must get a correct alignment and we have to enhance the biology by bone grafting and we have to give a stability this is the basic principles by which we assess non union and also make sure that we in during the surgery we provide all these parameters to get it right correctly sorted out so in this what we did was like see like there is always a shift here that we need to sort it out and also the medial side we have to get a medial column support that is very good so if you get a medial column support very well in addition you get a plate on the outer side on the lateral side generally it will go on to heal well so you have to have a medial here so there are many options for this this type of non union but one of the option i am going to give it to you is the fibular graft on the medial column so once you give it and then get the axis and then stability and biology it will be all right so what we did was to have a medial side fibula and all of them you see we have to achieve a good contact and compression here you see like although there is a small gap we have used a muller's compression device in this and then we got it collapsed and then we have for a period of time you can see this a 6 week post op and this is a 4 month post op and this is one year follow up you can see it has gone on to heal completely well so if you look at it a few things that we have done is we have to shift it medially so one of the idea is like if you keep a block suppose if you have a 6 to 8 mm stinman pin or 10 mm stinman pin in between the femur and the plate here and then try to collapse it always your shaft will get medialized and then you can get into a good medial contact and that's what we did in this and then slowly it has gone on to heal and he gets a good function so we also on this note we also have uh, uh, published this article in 22 patients series so and it has been uh, also we have wrote up the surgical algorithm for this type of non unions and then this is the another case that i am going to present here so this is one of the Uh, routinely seen type of a open fracture you will always see there is a small wound here on the contrary underneath there is a fracture that is either comminuted or there is going to be a bone loss this is because of the uh, pillion riders in our two wheelers they have a direct hit on the opposite vehicle and then you will see that the bone gets ejected out and he is a 31 year old gentleman it's a uh, and then on the on arrival his vitals were all stable but only thing was serum lactate was very high and when we put in our ganga hospital score it was in a stage it's like a group 2 and then we had to do a, a staged reconstruction once the lactate levels normalized then we had to do a staged reconstruction so we did debridement and then this is the fracture and then the wound that is there and then what do we do now it is question is we have to take them up once we have to make sure that resuscitated well and then get his normalized lactate levels meanwhile debridement is your uh, like a decontamination is one of your resuscitation procedure itself as you resuscitate make sure you debride it and also put an external fixator 
and that is the right time to do an articular reconstruction as well. So we did an articular reconstruction and then you get a knee spanning external fixator so that you do the staged reconstruction. So later when it was, we asked him to come over a month's time, but unfortunately he had come out 10 weeks later. However, it was good enough. There was no signs of infection. The swelling has settled down and then he has completely like a supple area where you can go ahead and operate. And then at this stage, there are many methods of reconstruction you can think of. You can do an Elizero, you can do a limb reconstruction system, orthofix. You can do various transport over the nail, transport over the plates, much, many, many more options are there. So one of the options we did was like, we chose an allograft because we do, we are a, a big center for the open injury management. A lot of mangled limbs we do get, and some of these amputations are all there where we send them to our Kidwa center in Bangalore and get everything sorted out. And then we have a bone bank. So we have this, and then we used an allograft. So here we shape it and then nicely shape it to the position and then get it, get it in. And also like intramedullary region of this graft, we pack our autographs as well. So take an autograft, combine with allograft and then pack it inside, nicely compact it inside and then uh, get the allograft in. And then of course, like you have to do a good fixation. And once it is fixed well, and then it is an immediate post-op that you see here. So it is a long segment graft. So one, it is around 12 centimeter graft. And then you can see that at four months, there is a mild callus formation. It is one year follow-up here. And then it is two years. Still, you see there is some amount of a suspicion of a non-union sort of thing. But however, he is walking well and he has got a good knee movements and he also walks well. And then this is 11 year follow-up. You can see that it is completely incorporated. What is important is allograft usage is one of the method of reconstruction. But however, if only it is a minimally contaminated or if there is no contamination, and if it is the debridement is excellent, then only you must think of an allograft. The fixation principle and bone graft supplementation to be followed as any other case. The long term follow up is essential in allograft purely because it incorporates and to incorporate and to vascularize, it takes very long time. So that is why what we, what we made a change is. So in these instances, we also went on to do a Kepana technique. Kepana was technique was described for the tumor, pro, tumor uh, bone gaps. We went on to do it in trauma series as well. And then like it, uh, vascularization also is easier. And then the uh, union also is far superior to only usage of an allogram. So that also we have published and it is uh, in this trauma case reports as well as uh, in, in Indian Journal of Plastic Surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Great cases you have shown to us. And the uh, allograph is, which is, I think it must be done in a uh, well planned way. Just shifting from Coimbatore to Bangalore, am I right? The allografts? No, 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 no. We have a bone gap. Preparation, I'm saying, it has to go through a lot of preparation. Like, you have to take out the, all the fatty content, everything will have to take it out. It goes through one series of procedure at, in the hospital. And then for irradiation, it goes to Bangalore. We used to send it to Mumbai in the beginning. Then in, the, in Bangalore itself, they have the facility and they do it. And we have a bone. They, it comes back and we store it in our hospital. And then we use it in all these cases. Right. Comment from faculty, please. Or Nick, please. Yeah. Yes, that's that's an excellent example because sometimes uh, people forget uh, the use of the proper use of allografts in big defects, and uh, the comment about infection. You know, every method, if there is residual infection in situ, will fail. What I mean is, uh, debridement is of paramount importance. Either if you do a muscle or if you do anything including even uh, free frames and, you know, destruction of stereogenesis. And um, that is um, the more comfortable you become on uh, doing and producing bigger defects from what nature is giving you because you want to debride into the healthy tissue, 
the more comfortable you can with that, then actually management of defects can be effective with uh, different techniques. The priming is of key importance, and I totally agree with you. Thank you. Dr. Shushut, any comment? I think great cases, as always, did he, uh, totally throwing the ball out of the court and out of the box thinking. Terrific. Oh, wow. The first case was very good because that was a total learning, right? Somebody did one, again failed without seeing the bone grafting, and third, sir has revised it. Any comment from Dr. Manny, sir? Yeah, did he excellent uh, cases? and excellent experience with the complex reconstruction. Since Nick is also here, uh, do you have uh, experience with the masculine technique uh, in uh, primary severe trauma? Yes, absolutely. I mean, for us, it's a workhorse. And uh, nowadays that, uh, you know, the orthoplastic uh, combined uh, approach regarding the bridement, et cetera, on open fractures, is established, uh, we create uh, big defects that uh, the muscular protocol in the acute setting, a spacer, you may even revise the spacer uh, to because it has some kind of technical details that in the overnight uh, insertion of you know antibiotics is not exactly a spacer for the muscular. So usually we go in a second stage on the stage of grafting with soft tissue coverage. We put then a proper spacer overlapping the edges of the bone, creating, you know, a, a better environment, a better envelope. And then uh, on a second stage, obviously, a couple of months later, we come back to, to offer the grafting phase plus minus uh, augmentation of the, of the fixation, either with a, another plate or uh, exchange the old plate to a new one because we all need to appreciate it's a race between fatigue failure and uh, established union. So if you have any concerns uh, revising the implant that has been exposed to stresses for the last two, three months on the between stages, is not a bad idea. So yeah, so did we do it at good sets. Sorry. Did he have you used masculine technique? Sorry, no, I missed like that. A, Could yeah. you say it again? We have used masculine technique in uh, infection scenarios. Whereas when it is an open fracture scenario, you see, uh, we, we actually, if you look at it, if, you, if your infrastructure is more towards orthopedic practice and you have to call a plastic surgeon for all the other work, generally your mask, you will jump towards a masculine. Yeah. But we have in-house plastic surgeons so our pr protocol is completely different. For us, any polytrauma or open fracture, anesthetist receives it, make sure the patient is all right. Plastic surgeon is called first to do the debridement and we go ahead to fix it. So it is, it is a, uh, it all works together. So in that scenario, what happens is we know what is being done and then we have to think of what next, what next and all those things. We plan it on day one itself. And majority of the times it is an orthoplastic procedure. So often we don't do a masculine in the open fracture scenario. Rarely in a distal femur, when we are fixed by distal uh, lateral plate, and then we feel that there is some defect on the medial side that we have to manage somehow. And those scenarios, we have done few cases where we have put in cement. And then by end of six weeks, we have gone back and did bone grafting and plating. So that is the only scenario where I would have used a bone cement in the primary situations in a open practice. Just, just to make a comment, for us as well, there is a combined presence from day zero of a consultant plastic surgeon and a consultant orthopedic surgeon. But maybe the state of the patient is not for big deal overnight. For many of them are polytrauma or you know, other situations. So then uh, you go in a stage protocol anyhow because of the conditions. So there is a combined approach as well for us. Maybe can I ask a question, please? Yeah, please, please. Yeah. In the case of uh, allografts, and sometimes even in masculine or stuff where we are putting it in a similar grafts, the lysis happens in the central portion. And in your case, you have not the vascularized one, the first one case, do you feel that 
additional because we were discussing that in an acute case as well putting in a dual plating so do you feel that sometimes after one year or so the medial middle part of it can again give way because of the revascularization occurring from the end, both the edges and lay stress on the lateral aspect or you might be requiring some augmentation either intramedullary or a dual plate for such thing when you are using an allograft you mean this long segment allograft yes, that i yes, yes yes no see like that's why we have followed it for 11 years now yeah yeah no so so it is we continuously call them every year and then we are making sure he is doing well and then i don't know we have to, uh, there is no experiment to do no. it i am i don't no because if you see also in your serial x rays also the callus started forming which is obvious and logical from the both the edges yeah, yeah. and we have seen in my case is of masculine also where we have used fibula as a intramedullary strut the lysis happens in the central portion so would Now, it lay more stress on the plate is, as such this is a very big allograft distal femur probably it may not break as quickly yeah. as yeah, you sure. expect it to but i think right now by 11 years it should have incorporated oh, the study yeah, say yeah. around 3 to 4 years it incorporates so. thanks right thank you so much uh, we'll go to the next talk in the last talk of the session dr ritap please thank you and i will sh screen share my screen so i have two cases and uh, your screen sharing is paused so uh, did you can you stop sharing chetan, your screen you stop uh, chetan can you it's allow it's, it's allowed Rita. for dr rita no your sc sc uh, screen sharing is paused Okay. Uh, so, one second. Let me check. So, can you share the video, uh, the uh, PPT with me, please? I'll play it on your behalf. It was earlier running. There is no problem from our end. Uh, share screen. Share. No, your screen sharing is paused. can you click uh, double click on what i mean on the screen or can you just uh, uh, leave uh, and close Please. the ppt once can you uh, close the ppt once okay i do that now open it okay i open it again okay, okay my cases are essentially a lot of familiarity similarity with, with the others and uh, a revision basically of what has been discussed so this is now open so i share my screen yeah and now i share yes now it's come here yeah it's coming up yeah yeah so this is a 55 year old gentleman with an isolated closed knee injury and he is stable and it's a 33 c3 and uh, first question is that yes we need a direct reduction and plating or indirect reduction and plating or direct and indirect reduction and plating or direct indirect reduction plating and bone grafting so i believe these questions have all been answered and there is a mix of principles here and yes we need absolute stability at the articular block as can be seen by the lax screws in the hofa as well as a screw holding the intercondylar fragments the metadiaphysis needs relative stability and bone grafting as uh, one of the panelists had suggested that in fear of delayed union why not pack it with something if not autograft fill in the synthetic bone graft and that was done here so this is the immediate post op as one can see the staples so the question now is what will happen will the fracture unite 
will the plate break will the plate bend will the screws pull out or will the screw, screws break so at 6 months down the line the plate starts bending the articular block fixed by open direct reduction heals well generally heals well despite an open reduction it heals well and is rarely a cause of non union the metadiaphysis where indirect reduction is emphasized reemphasized is the zone of unhappiness because of the vascular compromise so whenever we violate it either with a surgical footprint in the form of a metal screw or anything else and like in this case an attempt to reduce the fragment and put in bone graft synthetic the vascularity takes a hit so the question now is that this patient is destined for another surgery so what should be done replating and bone grafting dual plating and bone grafting retrograde nail retrograde nailing plus plating plus bone grafting or dynamization of the plate and bone grafting so the fifth point was never discussed and unfortunately in this gentleman the fifth option was chosen and you can see a cloud above i will talk about this subsequently so this patient underwent a dynamization of the plate and bone grafting and lo and behold the locking screws have started breaking now so what is this a jumble of principles so now the question is the patient is destined for a third surgery and there is a cloud overhanging so now what needs to be done plating and bone grafting dual plating and bone grafting nailing fixator many options so what was done in this case was implant removal tissue sent for culture screw holes filled with calcium phosphate bone bone graft paste correction of the varus use of a single lock plate and bone graft so the idea is to balance mechanics with biology so bone paste filled into the screw holes in the distal fragment and the cautery cable used to check the correction of the alignment along with the direction of the first guide wire in the distal articular block being parallel to the joint line so post surgery this is the x ray as one can see the staples with lot of bone graft packed in and this is the subsequent follow up so the fracture goes on to unite so the learning is that the articular fracture needs direct reduction this is the anatomical or principle for it it is the metadiaphysis that needs indirect reduction and sometimes we violate that inadvertently in redo surgery always think of that cloud hanging on all the slides previous to this a thing of infection so always send tissues for culture beware of retained hardware in redo surgeries and do take consent that sometimes it's possible that we may leave behind something which we could not extract if it were not interfering in the surgical process let it be and adhere to the principles like has been reemphasized reduction fundamentally means avoiding varus getting the medial side touch each other if possible and augmenting biology and always balance mechanics with biology so this was the first case and now i go to the second case so i share my screen again and now we have the second case so this is a usual story in india a 13 year old boy given a two wheeler and sometimes a car his mother and his sister are the pillions and he is hit by a four wheeler somewhere around 10 pm all the three are injured and this young boy has an isolated 
right lower limb injury around the knee. So this is the clinical picture on day zero. So this is six hours later. He is in the OT. He undergoes a debridement, a bridging external fixator, and dead space management by bone cement. This is him at 72 hours, where a relook debridement is done, and the skeleton is reconstructed using a proximal humerus locking plate laterally and a distal medial tibia plate medially. The dead space is filled with bone graft, with uh, synthetic bone, uh, sorry, bone cement, in which 40 grams, 2 grams of vancomycin and 160 milligrams of gentamicin have been mixed. The fixator is retained because the there was hardly any bone in the distal fragment to get a secure, good hold. Six weeks later, The cement is removed and the void is filled with autograft and allograft. And uh, we are this uh, other center other than Ames in North India to have a bone bank facility. And we are thankful to Dr. Sudhir Kapoor who set it up in our hospital two and a half, three years ago. So this is him at six months, young boy with good bone healing potential. And he goes on to heal well. This is him at follow up two years down the line. He has about 60 to 70 degree knee bending. His wounds have all healed well. And this is him walking. Three years down the line, he is walking well, he is compensated well, but as one can see, he is compensating by tilting his pelvis down. So, he's a young, flexible boy. So, all the hardware is removed, and subsequently, at three years, six months, this is the next surgery of lengthening begun. So, this was done a month ago and his lengthening has started now. So the learning from this case is that trauma is a time-sensitive disease. And as has been repeatedly said by professor from UK, Dr. Didi sir from Coimbatore, Vivek, Shushut sir, quality of debridement remains the most crucial variable. In all such cases, family support is indispensable. And counseling is very vital. I think we spend a lot of time operating, but a lot less talking. I feel a balance of operating and talking goes a long way in helping these patients. At the end of the day, whatever we do, patient commitment is the key in, in their recovery. And if we follow well-established principles, the outcomes are likely to be much better than what we expect. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhav, for great cases. Any questions, comment from the faculty? Ritam, why did you choose that proximal humerus plate? So we had all the periarticular plates with us. Number one, we needed a uh, plate with small screw option. So on the distal femur, we placed the proximal humerus locking plate. We felt that it fit well of all the options that we had. We could direct two or three screws. The, the direction of screws is all right, is it? I have never yeah. used it, so please educate yeah. me. So we felt that that was the best option we could get small screws in that small fragment of lateral condyle we had. Yeah, sure. very nice. In fact, if I can say the proximal humerus plate phyllos fits very nicely with the lateral. We have used it in achondroplasia patients, which were very small and having small bones. In fact, the top A screw goes parallel, top A screw goes parallel and the lower calcar screws acts as your set screw going into the opposite calcar, opposite so, condyle. Obliquity of the screws is not a problem, Ritab Vivek? No. You can place it slightly higher and then the 
90 100 degree can be done prithav will be able yeah. to no 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 vivek has much more experience with than me like i said we used we had all the plates on on the house all indian manufactured plates right left up down we fit, fit each plate and then i and my colleague dr pushkar we felt this is the best option so that's why we used that then we went on to the medial side like dr nick had said it's the fear of going there once we start doing it i think that fear will dispel yes. and open injuries to the young orthopedic surgeons are a very rich learning experience because the anatomy is all there open for you to learn nice absolutely the other thing is that the distal medial tibial plate is perfect for the medial condyle as well as even the phyllos has been used or the proximal tibial plate matches also that environment so or a simple straight recon if you obviously have such a small simple fracture just want a buttress but very good example and uh, great my question would be only the length obviously discrepancy uh, on the acute setting we are all obviously focusing on minimizing the defect you know putting the the antibiotic uh, you know spacer I think on the, on the final closure before you exit is a thing to reconsider because at that moment you can actually get the length and uh, prepare or prevent a future obviously more complex reconstruction. So I think uh, now that we're getting more familiar with huge defects due to the nature of having a lot of options to manage defects as long as they are diaphyseal or metadiaphyseal, uh, not leaving people with uh, leg length discrepancies is uh, on the first stage is a good, uh, you know, planning exercise. Right. Point well noted, sir. So this gen boy was 13 years old and his growth plate had been shattered. So there was hardly any bone left. So probably I feel it is the distal femur growth plate which shut down, primarily responsible for his limb length discrepancy. Yes, correct. I stand corrected. Yes, thank you. Sir. Thank you, Yutab. Can you stop sir. sharing, please? Yutab, can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, he stopped. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I stopped. Yeah. Yutab, it is, uh, it is good and then it has healed well also. Uh, what, one, of, one of the comment is like in these kids, if you observe that if you can keep it in good traction and with the correct limb length, sometimes they can also throw bone. So spontaneous bone regeneration also is there. Right, sir. So when, when you are doing it in sixth week itself, you will see some amount of faint line of periosteum throwing the bone in kids. So yeah. we have had yes, few sir. cases and we are publishing it. So. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Any more questions, comments, not a many? Mm, excellent uh, cases, a lot of learning and... Uh, any questions in the chat box which need to be taken up? Oh, I can't look at any. It is done, I think. So. No more new. So we are almost dot uh, on time. Just probably. I'll oh, ask, yeah. I'll ask uh, one or two questions regarding HOFAs to all the faculty. Tips for the HOFA and two points. Uh, surgical approach, like isolated medial, isolated lateral or both condyles. The surgical approach where you use it. So far only, we're talking only. So maybe Shashwat can take it. Yeah. yeah. Isolated lateral or isolated medial uh, swashbuckler of varying extent is probably the best because that will give you good exposure. Laterally, there is no doubt because it is anterolateral. You can see the articular surface. You can reduce it well. For uh, medial side, Swashbuckler has a very limited exposure. So I think the classical, uh, if it's a small fragment and only purely um, medial condyle uh, involvement of medial hofas, a medial parapetal approach is okay. Uh, smaller incision. But because uh, in my case, it was a bicondylar thing, I had to uh, have a extensile approach. Uh, if it is medial, try to preserve uh, VMO because that is one uh, muscle that will give you 
better rehabilitation. Uh, I think that's about it. Did you want to add something? So in Hofas, of course, see, this is an exceptionally rare case. If it's a lateral, you go lateral. If it's a medial, you go medial. So the only question is, this is an extremely rare case. And uh, I think I have nothing else to add to Dr. Sustur's comment. There are approaches which have been described for the smaller osteochondral fragments, which are type C, type little or 2C and the other small osteochondral where you can go posterior as well. And you can go medial to the MCL post slightly by, you can see there's a few big article by anatomical research by Dr. Tirachai. And he has shown the amount of exposure you can get. So for the medial POFAS, which is a small posterior where you want to put in a posterior to anterior screw, maybe that's the approach where you can go posterior to the MCL. And in lateral way also, you can go posterior right on the condyle in a prone approach. But that's for a very rare, smaller entities, very less common, let me your type 2C or 2B, which was for which you use. Otherwise, the approaches which Dr. Sushrut and Ritab have said suffice for most of your fractures. I think we have covered enough for the distal femur fracture along with the peritrocytic implants, key care and all that. And Dr. Nick has shown the proximal THR also to cover that part also. I think all the aspects are covered. But many, any, any other point you want to cover now? Many last Nick, comments. anything anything on HOFAS, Nick, you want to add? Uh, on the HOFAS. On yeah. the HOFAS, uh, I have uh, been uh, from the back due to a sequestrum of a young uh, teenager. And after I've been through that posterior approach, I believe it's an excellent... Uh, Reduction, it's automatic, and it's an excellent approach for back to for like uh, from back to front screws, which are also lagging the HOFA fractures better. But obviously, you need the patient prone. The majority of my previous experience before that guy was like four years ago with the sequestrum, was all uh, direct medial or through the front as a uh, midline approach are uh, uh, previously discussed. But I think, again, approaches is always a limiting factors, uh, factor for us. We are biased by our training, by our exposure, by, by luck. And uh, I think nowadays we are living in an era that uh, we approach periarticular fracture much more free, freely. So I would challenge everyone uh, in the next cadaver course to expose the, from the back uh, potential HOFA, and you will be amazed. So thanks, uh, Nick. I think that's a very relevant question. And probably learning is coming from the medial condyle of the tibia. We've gradually learned to go posterior and we have found that it's an excellent uh, biomechanical solution to handle them. And I'm sure uh, HOFA has a similar scenario, both uh, because of the fracture type as well as mechanism of injury, whether it is an hyperextension or it is a dashboard type. A tricky thing about HOFAS, what we have experienced is uh, when do they unite? It's a very tricky uh, sort of a fracture, which probably takes a long time to unite and uh, you never know when it has united. So until uh, it doesn't displace, you really don't know whether it has united or not. So uh, it's a tricky uh, fracture to evaluate. So I think uh, Dr. Bageja, thanks a lot for uh, conducting an excellent uh, webinar on a very important uh, fracture. And uh, thanks to all the faculty, an excellent uh, group uh, who has brought out some very, very interesting cases, I feel. Uh, some uh, classical, some very, very unique uh, solutions to common problems. And also opened up uh, uh, the discussion on uh, dual fixation, both uh, medial plate as well as nail plate construct, as well as a biological uh, fibular nail on the med medial side. So I'm sure uh, uh, everybody has learned a lot. We've uh, recorded this webinar and it would be available on uh, our website uh, through the DOA library, as well as uh, on the Omnicurus uh, website. So you're always welcome and you can share it with your institutes to come back to it. And uh, the last part of each webinar, we announce the next one. So next Sunday evening, we have a 
webinar on uh, risk. It's not evening actually. Next Sunday is our mid-year meeting. So uh, the theme is again trauma and we are trying to discuss uh, risk injuries. So it's going to be a morning session and we start uh, around 10 a.m. Indian time and maybe uh, lead up to the lunch and finish by 2 p.m. So thanks a lot uh, to all the faculty. Grateful to you to taking out time and sharing your cases. And we call it a day and all the best and have a nice uh, evening watching the important uh, Euro Cup final. And all the best, Nick. Thank you very much for your wishes as well and for the yeah. invitation. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Take, take care, everyone. Lovely meeting bye. you. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Dr. Bageja? Dr. Bageja? Yes, sir. Sir, bahut badiya. Thank you, Sameer. Thank bahut you so badiya. much. Well done. Thank you Solid. so much. Solid. Thank you so much. Everybody's free by 8 o'clock. Thank you. Bahut badiya, 8 o'clock and a uh, lot sir, of things covered again. and a lot of